Hi, this is Randall Schwartz, host of Floss Weekly. This week, Guillermo Amaral joins me. We're not going to be talking about something. We're going to be talking to something. We're going to be talking to satellites with our software from the ground. You're not going to want to miss this, so stay tuned. Netcasts you love. From people you trust. This is Twit. Bandwidth for Floss Weekly is provided by Cashfly at C A C H E F L Y dot com. This is Floss Weekly with Randall Schwartz and Guillermo Amaral. Episode 341, recorded June 17th, 2015. Satnogs. This episode is brought to you by DigitalOcean, simple and fast cloud hosting built for developers. Develop an SSD cloud server in 55 seconds. Try it today for free. Visit digitalocean.com, and once you sign up, be sure to enter the promo code FLOSS in the billing section for a $10 credit. And by Braintree. If you're working on a mobile app and searching for the right payments API, check out the Braintree V.0 SDK. With one simple integration, you get every way to pay. To learn more and to try out the sandbox, go to braintreepayments.com slash floss. It's time for Floss Weekly, the show about free, libre, open source software. I am your host, Randall Schwartz, Merlin at Stonehenge.com, bringing you each week the movers, the shakers, the big projects, little projects, projects you may be using every day and not aware of it, projects you may want to download right after this show because something really cool inspired you to do something else. And you can tell this isn't reading this copy because I always flub up somewhere in the middle of this. <laughs> Let me go ahead and bring on my co-host, Guillermo Amaral. Welcome back to the show. Hey, Randall. How's it going? It's going well, going well. And where, where are you speaking to us from? Uh, still in my secret Tijuana bunker here. As you can see, okay. it's a little messy this time, but it's it's still good. Well, that's, <laughs> because, you're clean, a ma- so. that's because you're a maker. You're always like tweaking on things, right? <laughs> yeah, you know. <laughs> which, which is going to be especially appropriate for this show. I should probably say that for those that recognize the green tree behind me, yes, in fact, I'm back at ZipRecruiter headquarters this week, uh, or at least today. Uh, well, at least this morning, I'm heading back over to the other headquarters a little bit a little bit in the afternoon. Uh, and uh, that's in Santa Monica, so lovely, uh, lovely June gloom weather here, which is really kind of ugly. But the show's not about where we're speaking from. It's about our guests and the projects they represent. This week, no exception. We have representing the, I don't know how to pronounce this, but we'll just go Satnogs Project uh, and uh, see if I can get his name right there. Pieros Papadeus uh, is going to be speaking to us in a few minutes about Satnogs. Uh, what do you know about this so far? Uh, well, you know, I, I didn't really know much about it until we we scheduled the show. I started looking into it and seen something I, I personally think is super interesting. I never knew you could actually talk to uh, privately owned satellites on, on the sky. And, you know, it's a little weird for me. But, yeah, it's super interesting. Let's let's back it up and get get more context. So what this is is some open source software and a bunch of hardware maker stuff. You know that's all hardware is beyond me. So I'm hoping you're going to pick up on a lot of this stuff and help me out. But as open source software and hardware to actually talk to uh, low Earth orbit satellites. So there's a bunch of those things up there now. Some of them are are commercial operations. Some of them are amateurs have managed to uh, get piggyback launches on some uh, some of the recent uh, trips upstairs. And uh, this is the ground stations that can talk to those low Earth orbiting satellites. Also, I see there's uh, even an uh, opportunity to talk to uh, high weather balloons. So if you have uh, if you have high weather or high weather, high altitude balloons, high weather, I'm supposed <laughs> to be dangerous. <laughs> oh, and comes a hurricane. No, no. Uh, <laughs> high altitude balloons and, and using Satnox to talk to that. Um, and it's it's like a whole network where you're like, uh, you know, you've got all these ground stations, you have to coordinate who has the radio time and all those and how do you send information in and out for all that. But And it sounds really fascinating, but it's a really out of this world project. I think the last time I got this excited about actually talking to people about things is uh, when we did the Mars rover drivers back about, God, it was like seven years ago, six years ago. So this looks pretty good from that perspective. Anything else you want to add there, uh, Guillermo? Uh, well, maybe just point out that it is literally a not of this world project. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, I think that's what I was aiming for. <laughs> that's what I was aiming for. All right. Well, we're going to get started in just a second, but I have a very important message I need to bring you before we get into the the body of the show. When you whether you're an experienced code warrior or just getting started, you need flexible, reliable, and affordable hosting. DigitalOcean provides developers with droplets, which are virtual private servers that can be customized and deployed quickly to host websites, web apps, production applications, personal projects, virtual desktops, and almost anything else you can think of with full root access. 
I myself as a, I'm a customer of DigitalOcean. I found out about them back in at scale back about was it about three months ago, and they were giving away free coupons to be able to get some time with that. And I, they actually said well, you can deploy uh, an entire uh, server in 55 seconds. And you know what? It was true. I filled in all my billing information, and 55 seconds later, I had a free BSD box running in the cloud, running on SSD hard drive, really, really fast. Use my build box now when I want to build packages for my other uh, more traditional server. So uh, DigitalOcean is built for developers and used by over 400. 100,000 of them, including me. You can choose your OS, Ubuntu, CentOS, Debian, Fedora, CoreOS, and FreeBSD. FreeBSD is mine. And a one-click install allows you to develop uh, apps like Django, Docker, Drupal, LAMP, GitLab, MediaWiki, Node.js, WordPress, Ghost, Magento, OwnCloud, Ruby on Rails, and more. And the servers can have up to 20 CPUs, 64 gigs of RAM, and 640 gigs of SSD hard drive space. It's all SSD. It's all really fast. Highly scalable, scalable to meet the demands of a rapidly growing application or business. And there's web console access with HTML5, plus you get SSH access, SFTP, KVM, and VNC for virtual desktops. And it's so easy to get started. You can deploy an SSD cloud server in as little as 55 seconds. I verify that. So DigitalOcean has incredibly affordable and straightforward pricing. Servers start out at only $5 a month. Where are you going to find a deal like that? $5 a month. There's also hourly pricing available starting at less than a penny an hour. But we're going to make it so you can get started today and deploy an SSD cloud server for free. Visit digitalocean.com and create an account. Once you confirm your email account information, go to the billing section and enter the promo code FLOSS, F-L-O-S-S, for a free $10 credit. That'd be two months for free for the $5 machine. That's plenty to get started and explore what DigitalOcean can do. That's digitalocean.com. And once you sign up, enter the code F-L-O-S-S in the billing section for a $10 credit. We thank DigitalOcean for their sponsorship of Floss Weekly. And now let's go ahead and bring on our guest, uh, Pieros Papadeus. Welcome to the show. Hey, hey, Randall. Hey, Guillermo. Thanks for having me. And uh, where are you speaking to us from? Uh, Frankfurt, Germany. Very cool, very cool. Uh, so we got a sort of a, well, two continent show. Sometimes we have more than, more than two continents. I guess this will, this will have to do. Uh, so um, I gave sort of the overview of what I think Satnogs is about, but why don't you give us, I guess, quite literally the 30,000 foot view? <laughs> <laughs> well, more than 30,000, but yeah, still. Um, so Satnox is a satellite network open ground station. And uh, what we're building is a network of ground stations, uh, which is the setup that lets you talk back and forth to satellites, and specifically low-Earth orbit satellites. And uh, we focus on that because the majority of satellites are actually low-Earth orbit ones. Um, in contrast with what many people you know, think about satellites, um, which is geostationary, the ones that we use mainly for uh, TV and uh, you know, media streaming and everything else. Um, so we're not talking about the stationary ones, we're talking about the lower Earth orbit ones. And Satnox is creating a full stack of technologies, including the ground station, the antenna design, the receiving and transmitting, uh, radio components, um, the embedded PC that runs um, on the ground station side, and then the network on top of that that coordinates all the different ground stations uh, in order to provide scheduling um, and observational opportunities for multiple operators around the world. Well, now, now, first off, you brought up a good point. These are not geostationary. So that means if I were to sort of be able to see this with magical eyes, it would actually be going across the sky. How long does it take to transit the, uh, the sky? Depends on the bus and depends on the satellite, but it would be a couple of minutes, uh, up to 15 or 20 minutes. Um, still depends on the satellite, but definitely something which is moving, and that's why we need the rotator to actually follow the satellite across the sky. And once it's lost... We hope that we have uh, enough ground stations around the world to actually follow the satellite after um, there is uh, the loss of uh, visual contact, basically. Oh, okay, so you're talking about actually doing relaying so that uh, as it goes from one ground station to another, you'd be able to maintain a continuous conversation? Mm -hmm. Yeah, and uh, we aspire to create a global network that can facilitate that 24-7 for all LEO satellites. Okay, now these satellites are obviously there before you started this project, so how were people talking to them before? So, um, well, uh, first off, there is not necessarily, there was not necessarily a need to actually continuously talking to the satellite, but uh, even... Um, when you have a satellite like this, before Satnox, you would have a rotator which you could get commercially um, from various companies that are actually building rotators, set up your own ground station and uh, wait for the satellite to pass above you to actually get such a contact. Um, what Satnox is bringing on top of actually re 
um, reconstructing the rotator using open source software and hardware. Uh, it's also the connectivity between the ground stations, so the network piece of it. And uh, how, how long ago did Satnogs get started and, and what triggered that? <laughs> Uh, so that's approximately a year now, uh, and uh, it was back in, well, more than a year. Uh, it was back in end of April uh, last year, 2014, and uh, we, as Hackerspace .gr, uh based out of Athens, Greece, uh, we entered the NASA Space Ops Challenge, which is a yearly challenge, um, well, two-day event, uh, with challenges, space challenges, um, that hackerspaces around the world are um, uh, clustering around the various projects and trying to provide solutions. And uh, there was a specific project about uh, developing a ground station, not necessarily a networked one. And uh, we entered the, the, the NASA Space Up Challenges. Um, and during the weekend, we actually deployed the first version of a rotator. And um, um, after that, we actually wanted um, that to go bigger. And we thought, well, why if you have a ground station, you don't actually connect multiple ground stations and create a global network? And that's how the Satnox project actually uh, was born. That's awesome. Okay, so now you're able, or you, or you will eventually be able to have conversations with these uh, LEOs. Um, what 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 do you say to them? What, 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 what can be accomplished by talking to these things? So initially, we're focusing on receiving signals from uh, LEO satellites. And most of the signals are beacon, uh, beacons, like status beacons, beacons, basically, of the satellites. And also uh, the scientific payloads, the data from the scientific payloads that those satellites have. Um, most of the LEO satellites uh, lately are um, scientific projects through or commercial projects in CubeSats. And a CubeSat is a 10 by 10 by 10 centimeter, one kilo uh, small satellite. Um, and uh, lately we've been having hundreds of them uh, out, out there every year. And um, most of them are uh, experiments, scientific experiments, or um, it could be, you know, magnetospheric um, uh, measurements. It could be um, earth monitoring systems. It could be uh, experiments about radio communications or payload uh, um, capabilities. Um, so all of those have to transmit their scientific data back, basically, the results of the experiment. And uh, we are focusing on uh, receiving those kinds of payloads. So is this uh, government funded, uh, university funded, or... Uh private and, and uh, amateur stuff setting these up? So are you talking about Satnox in specific or yeah. are you talking about... No, no, I'm talking about the, the LEO satellites. How, how, how are they getting up there? Oh, uh, so pretty much all of the categories you mentioned. Uh, so there are uh, many lately uh, commercial projects from for-profit com uh, companies. Uh, traditionally, there have been many governmental agencies that have been sending satellites on LEO. Uh, there's also many academic projects that are going up there. So a combination of pretty much all of them. Cool, cool. Uh, uh, actually, we've got a picture of, I think, the very first Satnog base station got set up in Ath Athens. Uh, uh, for the people watching the video, they can see it, but uh, most of us are listening on the, on, on the audio. Can you describe what we're looking at here? Yeah, so this is uh, indeed uh, the first ground station that went online, and uh, this is on top of hackerspace.gr in Athens, Greece. Uh, and you can see one of the two antennas. Actually, the setup right now has two antennas. And uh, you're looking at the Helical antenna. This is the yellow uh, uh, um, uh, small pieces together with the wire, the coil that goes like a, a helix. Um, and this is on a UHF band, that would be the 70 centimeter band for uh, amateur radio um, communications. And uh, the box that you see on the center, which is, uh, has the front cover um, um, missing uh, because we're uh, well, using it for um, specific uh, services uh, at that point, um, uh, this is the rotator. This is the, the mechanical and electronics uh, equipment that uh, enables the antenna to point wherever uh, it needs to be pointing uh, um, um, on the hemisphere, on the, on the sky. Um, and it can go 180 degrees on the azimuth. Uh, and zero to 90 degrees on the elevation. So you can capture pretty much uh, all the satellite pass across the sky. And how fast is that rotating to track? Well, you said about two minutes for a pass possibly, so it might take, uh, it might be moving pretty quickly. Is it, does that cause any stability issues when you're having to move fast? Well, a, a two minutes pass would be a super low one and not really useful for satellite communications. But uh, for the average pass of the eight to 10 minutes of usable time, you would get uh, at peak, uh, you would get something around five to six degrees per second. And this is still uh, within the operational, um, operational abilities of the Satmox rotator. 
Uh, you you mentioned that the project also does a lot of open hardware. Uh, what part of the stack is actually open? Uh, is it the uh, base stations? Do you also do any, uh, maybe some hardware for uh, LEO uh, satellites that somebody wants to maybe launch up into space? So right now we're focusing on the ground station aspect of it, like the actual node that does the communication. So the open hardware pieces are, okay, I'm going to start with the antennas, uh, which is the receiving part. So we design and construct the antennas uh, ourselves and publish, of course, everything under an open hardware license. Uh, also the uh, duplexer, which is the way to combine two signals from different bands into one receiver. Uh, the mechanical assemblies, all, all that you see in the rotator, which is the, the gears, uh, the warm gears, the... Um, um, the shafts and the um, axis holders and everything else that you see inside the rotator are all uh, released as open hardware with documentation on how to actually build those things. Um, and right now we're also developing, we entered the ESA, um, the European Space Agency Summit of Code, and we have a student out of Spain that uh, he's developing a low noise amplifier, so RF components, also under um, open hardware licenses. Uh, is for example, you mentioned the antenna, the antenna bits of the uh, base station. Are are those getting milled by you, or are or, and the gears? In this example, are they three D printed? Are you purchasing the, these from some local supplier? So the the way that we go about it is that uh, we make sure that all the designs that we publish uh, can be easily constructed by anyone that has access on basic basic uh, tools and machinery, and especially on rapid prototyping tools like a three D printer on your local hackerspace. Uh, so you can uh, you can in practice construct everything from scratch by just having access on an average hackerspace, or if you have those things in your backyard, um, which, which would be awesome. Um, and um, as far as the kits and mailing and, you know, if we can supply some of those things, uh, at this point we don't, but we are looking into, many people have been asking that actually, and we understand that not everyone has access on, a, uh, unfortunately, on a local average hackerspace. Uh, so we also, um, we're also right now exploring, uh, starting September to supply some kits for some basic things that people cannot find. Well, you just answered my next question, actually. Yeah, I was wondering if you guys are supplying maybe kits to uh, people who are interested in building this. Um, now, if I first say, if I want to put uh, one of these base stations here in my secret bunker, you know, it's not really under the ground, as you can probably tell. <laughs> 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 but but if we if I want to put like let's say a base a base station here, do I need any you know a uh, line of sight, any clearance, any anything special, uh, uh, or maybe a mountain, or how how would I choose a nice location for this? So uh, well, two aspects of it. Uh, the first would be, yes, as much sky you can see, uh, that's better for the ground station and the network, um, obviously. Um, but um, at the same time, we recognize that not everyone has access to like really clear skies. Uh, so even if you have an obstacle, like a big, big building or a uh, giant mountain next to you, uh, the software can actually accommodate for that. So while you're registering your ground station to the network, you can say that I, I don't have access on this part of the sky, and we can take that into account when we do scheduling so that we know that we're not going to schedule you, uh, schedule to you a pass that goes through your obstacle. Um, so not necessarily any specific requirements uh, apart from network connection because we need the data back uh, while uh, once we capture them. Um, uh, and uh, yeah, cle as clear skies as possible. All right. So in this case, my secret bunker is located near a beach. I'm not going to say which one. Uh, <laughs> But uh, yeah, so usually here uh, you get a lot of overcast and you get a lot of clouds. That's not going to interfere with that in, at night, maybe? Uh, not necessarily. N not at all, I would say. So um, the, the clouds and rain are totally fine. The, the whole design is uh, waterproof. Um, but when we go to some kind of like extreme conditions, like high winds and snow and, you know, continuous ice, and if you go on the you know, like e extreme places, basically, uh, then you would have to, like the basic setup would not um, be appropriate. And for that, we actually developed a radom, which is a radio dome. Uh, you can think of it as, as, a, as a sphere that um, uh, surrounds the whole ground station, and it holds it um, in, you know, a waterproof and airtight uh, place so that uh, you don't like, get interference from um, weather elements. Oh, that's good. Uh so let's say you you just mentioned we need some sort of a uh, data connection for this. Is uh, can somebody just set up maybe a uh, I don't know, like three G connection or uh, can you do dial up maybe like if somebody still uses dial up? 
So the bandwidth that, um, well, a basic ADSL uh, broadband connection would, uh, would be enough. A 3G connection would actually be better in most cases around the world, uh, judging from what we've seen on, uh, you know, landline uh, broadband connections. Um, and um, yeah, a dial-up would not be an enough, especially when we are uploading the data back to the, to the network. So depending on how many uh, observations your ground station will um, um, get scheduled to do uh, by the network. Uh, you're going to have a, a lot of information, a um, couple of hundred megabytes probably per day that you need to upload um, back to the network. So that would have to, uh, would, we would have to take that into account when you're thinking about your network connection. Oh, nice. So is, is there any, any uh, let's say, any checks do you do that you do when you uh, have maybe a space station that's located somewhere where you don't really have a stable connection? If you get drop-offs or if it gets disconnected, uh, are you able to, uh, on the software side, I suppose, are you able to uh, uh, maybe re-ask for the information or how, how would that work? How, how would the, uh, how, would, how would working uh, throughout those uh, connection issues work on, on your end? So, um, again, two, two different aspects of this. The one would be that we are constantly monitoring the ground stations, uh, whether they're pinging the network for uh, next schedule observations. So every five minutes, a ground station actually pings back the network and says, hey, do you have a job for me? Do you have a job for me? Um, and uh, if there is a job scheduled for the ground station, then you receive all the appropriate information to run the job in some, some you know, time in the future. So that's the uh, aspect number one. And for that, if uh, a ground station has not checked in uh, for more than three hours, we actually say, well, three hours is the current setup. We might be changing that. But for some specific uh, time, uh, we say that, okay, this ground station is probably not available. We're sending an email to the ground station owner and we're putting it off the ground station scheduling op operations so that, you know, there is not an expectancy to, to uh, get information out of this uh, ground station. So that's the one part. And then the second part is that, um, let's say that, you know, you you have like a, a five minute check. You get a uh, um, uh, you get a scheduled observation to um, to do on a ground station. The ground station embedded um, uh, Linux um, platform actually performs the operation. But then once this data is captured, um, uh, the network is not available, so it cannot be sent back. So we've accounted accounted for that and said that uh, we have a buffer basically, like a, a disk, space, disk space, which is allocated uh, for storing locally observations. Um, and that could be enough for two or three days um, to store this information. And those will become available when the network is back in and the data gets to be posted back on the network. If it's more no, than to... that, then... Sorry. Yeah. Sorry, uh, we sure. actually have a station. We actually have a station. We actually have a question, <laughs> which sounds like station in my brain. Apparently, we actually have a question from PioSat in the in the chat room. Uh, I think you sort of covered this, but if you had one of those commercial trackers uh, already available, could you run the rest of the software stack against the commercial hardware? Yeah, that's a fantastic question. Uh, we designed Satnox from scratch to be completely modular, which means that you can eliminate any of our reference design, uh, that being the rotator in this in this case, and work with a commercially available rotator because we're using um, um, specific um, libraries and uh, protocols that are commonly available to, to everyone and most commercial operator, uh, most commercial rotators actually implement those. In this case, uh, this is called Hamlib. Um, it's a set of uh, ways to communicate with rotators. Um, and th then, yes, you can not necessarily use a ground station reference design that we have, but you can use a commercial rotator and still be able to post back uh, data to and be, post back data to network and be part of the ground station network that we have. And I'm also curious, you know, you said LEO uh, satellites, but uh, I'm thinking that the ISS qualifies as an LEO satellite. Is there any chance of getting data it from does. there? Yes, it does. And it actually hosts one of the most powerful uh, transmitters up there. So it's an easy target, basically, for us. Um, and, um, well, there are various different things that the ISS actually posts back. Uh, most of them are uh, relays of information. So you can use it. It's basically a transporter. And you use it, you, you talk to it from the ground, and then it relays this information back to the, to, to the ground at some point else. Um, and that can happen over voice or APRS, which is a... Um, a data coded uh, a data coded format uh, for um, location um, and encoding for location um, setting, um, and you can use ISS for for that. Uh, apart from that, ISS also operates uh, its own 
uh, Amata Radio Station, and you can listen to those, uh, um, you know, at some point, um, scheduled or not operations from astronauts on ISS that are talking back to the ground and talk to them also. Okay, and uh, th this this is obviously a limited resource, and now we're going to shift it slightly here. Uh, so scheduling, uh, how do you decide if two requests come in that both need the same ground station, uh, who gets it? So the requests about a specific satellite or different satellites? So let me rephrase that. Um, the requests are coming in asynchronously, right? Not synchronously. So someone goes in and says, well, I would like to follow this satellite in this frequency for this specific time frame. And then uh, once um, we present uh, to, to this operator the, the, the chart, uh, the timeline of the operations, including the ground stations and the different operations that each ground station will do. And if the operator is okay with it, then um, we schedule the operation. So this cannot really happen synchronously, right? Like it has to happen asynchronously. So it's a kind of like a first come first serve type of scheduling at this point. Uh, but we're also looking on uh, for some specific kind of ground stations that we know uh, that are reliable in operation and that we have a focused project that we need to work on, or setting aside some resources for some specific satellites to be available um, for those operators that need, need that. So kind of like overriding this uh, scheduling algorithm. Yeah, and, and especially uh, like when you're actually transmitting rather than receiving, uh, I imagine SatNogs isn't the only people that want to talk to a given uh, uh, satellite. So do you court, would you have to coordinate that with anybody else that might want to transmit at that time? And how do you do that? Yeah, so transmitting is much more complicated also on the legal side of it. So n not everyone with an uh, amateur radio equipment or software-defined radio or a uh, rotator like Satnox or any commercial can actually transmit. Um, so you need a license for that on most countries in the world. And even mm -hmm. with a license, you actually need uh, to be you know, really specific on what you're going to use, how many watts you're going to be using, and you know all those legal issues that you have around it. So right now, we're exploring the kind of like a user experience around transmitting, working in... Um, collaboration uh, with uh, CubeSat operators uh, to check their needs and you know what, how they're going to be actually doing that. Because frankly speaking, up until now, most CubeSat operators, like the vast majority of CubeSat operators, have not been thinking about, okay, what would happen if we could speak to, a, to our satellite 24-7? <laughs> so most of the um, CubeSat operators are uh, tailored around, okay, we're going to see our satellite um, like twice a day, like three times a day at best. And yeah, at that point, like no one else would speak to that. And they don't also know what to, exactly to say to the satellite, right? Um, you need to know many things in order to actually transmit information to a satellite for commands and everything else. Um, and there is also an authentication and um, um, security issue on that. So we're working with CubeSat um, operators to figure out how they, they're thinking about doing that in a 24-7 fashion, um, which is not still defined. Wow, that's really amazing stuff. And I know Guillermo is really hot to ask the next question, but I want to go pay the bills for a second. So this episode is brought to you by Braintree, code for easy online payments. If you're building a mobile app and searching for a simple payment solution, check out Braintree. The Braintree V.0 SDK makes it easy to offer multiple mobile payment types. Start accepting PayPal, Apple Pay, Bitcoin, Venmo, cards, and more, all with a single integration. Simple and secure payments, code you can integrate in minutes. Don't have time? Give them a call and they'll even handle the integration for you and walk you through it. SDKs in seven languages, .NET, Node.js, Java, Perl, yay Perl, PHP, Python, and Ruby. Elegant code with clear documentation and only 10 lines of in-app code. Braintree gives you an easy way to accept multiple payment types in one integration. Quick, knowledgeable developer support if you have any questions. Start accepting Apple Pay, PayPal, Bitcoin, Venmo, cards, and whatever's next, all in a single integration. With the Braintree V.0 SDK, one small snippet of code, and you're all set up in less than 10 minutes. To learn more, and for your first $50,000 in transactions fee-free, go to braintreepayments.com slash floss. And we thank Braintree for their sponsorship of Floss. And now, Guillermo, I think you had something hot to ask? Hot to ask, Randall. <laughs> <laughs> oh, sorry. Um, no, yes, uh, we've been focusing on the uh, hardware aspect of this for a little while. You mentioned embedded Linux uh, a few minutes ago. Can you give us an idea of how the, uh, the back and the, uh, the uh, software for this works? Uh, what languages are you using? Uh, how exactly are you guys using embedded Linux and in what parts? 
Yeah, so this is about the part that runs the actual ground station. So each ground station actually has an embedded PC um, Linux run um, on it um, that is next to the ground station. And on that, we I have all the uh, radio, um, software-defined radio that we use for um, RX and TX, for receiving and transmitting uh, signals. And we also uh, use it to command an Arduino that is controlling the stepper or DC motors for the actual rotation of the uh, rotator. Now, uh, this runs on uh, Linux, as I said, um, and specifically Debian at this point. Uh, we also used to have some um, uh, experimentation around OpenWRT in order to trying to minimize the resources needed to, to run um, um, the embedded part of the, of the client. Um, but we're now focusing more on, on the Debian side of things. Um, and the, on top of the actual operating system, we have what we call the Satnox client, which is written completely in Python, uh, well, at least the vast majority of it. Um, and the Python um, Satnox client makes sure to ping the network every once in a while, initiate all the different uh, scheduling observations, uh, run the capturing, run the um, the recording of the uh, and decoding if necessary of the signal, and posting back uh, things on the network. And of course, everything is open source and available through a website. Oh, nice. Uh, you mentioned you guys are using uh, Linux and a little uh, embedded system on on the uh, on the base stations, right? Uh, so. In this case, are you using something easily available, maybe like a Raspberry Pi or maybe a dev board that's you know out there right now, or are you building something custom? So the Satnox client right now is tested to run on a Raspberry Pi, on a Big Bloom Black, which is a reference design, on an Odroid C1, Odroid U3. Um, so we're testing a couple of different um, setups, and each one has a pros and the cons. But the reference design that we say to people uh, we suggest uh, that people use is a big bone black right now. Okay, so you are specifically telling them use this one since the other ones are maybe not that well tested right now. Well, the old the Raspberry Pi had their own issues, right? And the Raspberry Pi two actually solved them. So we are uh, in a final experimentation uh, um, phase to to give a green light on Raspberry. Pi 2, uh, which would be great uh, because it's more more easily available to people. Uh, and also Odroid C1, it's a super powerful machine from Korea, and um, we are also suggesting that. So it's not really, you know, we have a reference design, that's for sure, but uh, we're not saying to anyone, you know, like you cannot use an embedded PC that's out there. There are lots of different options. Well, that's great. And are, are, are other people, you know, porting your system over to like new dev boards out there? Uh, yeah, so a couple of different community members have been trying that on, on a humming board, on uh, some old beagle bones, even on a panda board. And uh, most of them seem to work really well. What's really an issue for us is uh, how the USB connection is handled and the USB receptacles and the voltage um, is handled on the actual device because we have been having some uh, troubles with the software-defined radio module that we use on that. Uh, so that's why we're super careful on saying uh, to everyone which is the device that um, you know they might be having a better luck uh, on implementing a, a client. But many community members have been doing a fantastic uh, job porting that uh, and testing it out on many different dev boards. Okay, you also mentioned uh, using an, an Arduino to uh, control the uh, the uh, uh, servos and gears on on your um, on your base station, right? Uh, are you really using like an official Arduino board, or are you using clones, or uh, maybe are you guys thinking of maybe later on building your own? Uh, your own little controller there? So whenever you do this, uh, it's always tempting to say, okay, I'm going to go with my own board, right? Like I'm, I'm going to do the my, my own electronics, I'm going to release it open hardware, and it's going to be best for the usage. But we, as, as I said, like we're trying to think to keep things as modular as possible so that people that have access to specific you know, components and boards like, can get started as easy as possible. So I, in this case, we're using an official Arduino Micro. Um, and we have been playing also with some other cores, um, which are Arduino Micro derivatives. And anything that runs an Arduino code, basically, uh, because that part of the code is written in wiring, um, then yes, it would, uh, it would be enough to drive the stepper drivers uh, or the DC motors. Okay. Yeah, you was just making sure since I know a lot of people mention when they when they're talking about like an Admel uh, micro, they just say Arduino to like wrap everything up in a nice little package. So it is one of you know an actually available board. People can just go and buy. In this case, a Beagle, uh, Beagle Bone Black and a few motors and a Arduino board, and they could. 
probably technically kind of get started with the electronics bits for this then? Yeah, the only thing that would be missing is kind of like a motherboard. Like we we have designed like a, a little receptacle basically for the Arduino Micro uh, that also hosts the um, Pololu drivers for the stepper drivers. Um, um, and that is not really a super complicated electronics um, uh, board and it's super cheap to either make it yourself or order it online. How are you powering all these little gadgets? Are, are you using power over Ethernet maybe uh, since you're technically get, need to be connected to the uh, to the base station somehow? Uh, or are, do you have your own power supply there? Are, are, is it battery powered? So we have um, actually have two different options. The one option, which is the permanent one, is powered over Ethernet, POE. Uh, and we uh, supply the 24 volts for uh, the motors, and then we drop the voltage with the voltage regulator down to 5 volts for everything else in there. Um, that would be the embedded PC and um, the software-defined radio, the low noise amplifiers, and everything else that we have in the rotator. And that's kind of like the permanent option. And then we've been trying uh, many mobile setups uh, for not only satellite operations, but also high-altitude balloon operations, as Randall said before, um, uh, using batteries uh, out of um, just standard batteries of uh, cars or you know everything that supplies approximately 13 volts, um, 12 to 14 volts, uh, would be enough to drive um, an operation. Uh, so if one of these space stations would be mobile, uh, are, how are you syncing up the uh, location? Are you guys do do you guys have a GPS inside the uh, base station? Yeah, so we would actually um, not be super comfortable of having multiple mobile stations on the network because uh, it's kind of like tedious to um, you know keep track and make sure the connection is um, is right and everything else. The mobile operations is mostly for experimentation on different bands, different satellites, different setups, and uh, on non-satellite operations like the high-altitude balloon ones. Um, so we don't expect necessarily to have many mobile um, ground stations on the network. Okay. Well, uh, you did mention uh, a community uh, before when we uh, talked about maybe porting somebody porting uh, the uh, software for the embedded Linux onto a different boards. How big is the community now uh, for development anyway? Yeah. So, well, community definition, right? Like what you count as community uh, can be many different <laughs> things. Um, so the core team would be like the people that are you know, constantly contributing, testing out new things, writing code, uh, designing parts and everything else, uh, would be approximately 20 people right now uh, around the world. And uh, we have a community of um, beta testers and people that are building ground stations, which is in the rounds of hundreds right now. Um, and we have a discourse forum that we're coordinating everything uh, in there um, regarding our global community, uh, which is under community.satnox.org. And how, um, how about, okay. oh, sorry, sorry, go ahead. Oh, okay, I was just going to ask, so um, uh, I, I think you said it already, but I was, I was busy watching the chat room to make sure there were any more questions, but uh, so how many actual deployments do you have so far? How many people are participating in the networks? So we recently did a new release of the network, so some old experimentation deployments are not online anymore. So currently we do have a production deployment of two ground stations. And okay. we have six, six ground stations that are uh, like literally next week or the week after that, like coming online, so. And, and what kinds of people are you looking at in terms of getting contributions? I mean, it sounds like there's a lot of different uh, pieces here, a lot of moving parts, uh, literally. <laughs> so what, what, what expertise would I need to be able to contribute to this? And should I have a particular background, say, I, I, I was just year in amateur radio before you got into this. Is there, is, there some, is there some people that are more naturally attracted to this kind of thing? <sighs> Yeah, so as you mentioned, because the, the stack is kind of like large, um, so we're looking at a multitude of different uh, skill set, um, uh, basically, for, for people to have. Uh, and it could be the primary um, focus right now has been uh, radio amateur uh, operators, uh, because they, they have the expertise on the antenna setup. They also have some of the legal issues solved if there is a transmitting opportunity for experimentation. Uh, and they also, like, they're quite familiar with uh, frequencies and, you know, all the setups around that. Now, 
that being said, uh, that's mainly on the operation of the ground station at this point. And uh, moving forward, and actually quite recently, we've been having many people on the software side, um, which is just Python coders or infrastructure guys or people that are working with you know huge loads of data to trying to uh, figure out what's happening in there. Uh, and also uh, mechanical design. So the actual reference ground station design, how the gears fit together. Um, so if someone has no idea about software, no idea about radio, but still is like really... Um, gear nerd or a mechanical nerd, then um, yeah, Satnox has a place for contributions, definitely for those things. And uh, so I'm more of a software guy. Um, I'm curious about, say, the uh, between the stations uh, protocols, and is there a central server that these all are phoning into? Um, uh, what, what does the wire protocol look like? How are you doing that? <sighs> So the architecture of that is uh, that we have a central server that we call the Satnox network on network.satnox.org. And um, that would be a Django-based uh, Python web application that coordinates um, all the different ground stations around the world. There is an API that the ground stations get to um, poke in order to get uh, any scheduled observations that they have uh, per ground station. Um, and then once this information is transmitted to... It's is retrieved from the uh, client side from the network, um, then the client side actually uh, makes um, the observation itself, records all the data, uh, decodes it, and then pushes it back through the same API back to the network. So uh -huh. Django-based Python application running on a server that hosts all the data and coordinates the different um, observations. And what database are you using? I think I know the answer. Uh, do you? Postgres. <laughs> Oh, you are? Oh, my God. Thank you. All right. Finally, a winner. Postgres. <laughs> Lovely. I, I just hate people who do green starts with MySQL these days, so I'm always trying to see if I can get around that somehow. Uh, and what was, I mentioned slightly about your background, but what brought you to this project? How did you all of a sudden see something you wanted to play with? So, well, it's not necessarily about myself uh, in specific, but uh, we've been, well, I also uh, have been uh, a radio amateur and uh, um, amateur astronomer. So kind of like combining those two, the passion for space and the passion for technology and the passion for radio. Um, mm -hmm. You know, it's, it's a natural fit to actually, you know, think about, you know, Satnox and um, uh, join such a product and, and kickstart such a product together with like-minded people. Um, so it was a combination of a love for space and a love for open source software and hardware and love for radio. That sounds really awesome. Um, let's see. Um, so you, we've talked about the community. What, what's the roadmap for this? What are you missing right now that's most critical? And where do you see yourself going maybe in a couple of years? So right now we're focusing on uh, um, more and more ground stations. So the really what's going to make the difference from what's out there in terms of satellite communications is a global network, as global as it can get. We're talking about hundreds of ground stations um, as soon as we can get them um, and multiple members in the community that can experiment with us, contribute back to the project and create new ideas around satellite communications and specifically this platform that we're building, Satnox. Um, so the next big push is basically around that, getting a ground station in any part of the world. Um, that's the, the main push for Satnox per se. And in the next couple of years, like we would like to see Satnox um, actually be the default option for any satellite operator uh, that would like to talk to their satellites um, back and forth um, and have Satnox be the standard for satellite communications on LEO. And uh, so... so let me, let me just think about cost for a second. I mean, let's say I've got a backyard and I've got a good internet connection. And I've got a clear view of the sky. Um, what are these ground stations going to set me back if I just wanted to say, yeah, I'll be a ground station. Uh, tell me what to do. So it depends on the specifics of the setup, but everything is around the ballpark of like $400, $400 to $500. Depends on the some of the radio setup, but that's kind of like the top for it. Cool, cool. And um, I'm just thinking now, when you're talking about hundreds of uh, phone homes back to your central server, what do you, what, how are you envisioning being able to scale what you're doing in, in the central office? Yeah, so this is a question about data scaling at some point. Um, and we've been having the, the help from GRNet, which is an uh, academic uh, research network uh, in Greece, uh, regarding their facilities uh, in terms of infrastructure to be able to scale more on the data side. Um, so there are some good options ab about that. And it all depends on the actual user experience that we want to provide to the operators. Um, and one of the biggest problems that we are um, 
going to face anytime soon, hopefully, um, is uh, the data retention and how much back we can have live data on the network. Uh, we're talking about, um, you know, terabytes of information and we're thinking about cold storage options, you know, what happens when someone wants to request like an operation like for three years back um, and how we're going to be dealing with that. So that's an exciting, actually, opportunity for us to dig into that and uh, be able to, to work with fantastic people around our community uh, to find a solution on that. Uh, you you mentioned a few uh, minutes ago, actually, that uh, you want to have base stations everywhere, right? Uh, so how would that work? Uh, it, there's some really specific places in, in the uh, world that might be a little bit too extreme. Uh, let's say maybe maybe the uh, uh, the desert, uh, the Mojave Desert, uh, the, the Atlantic or uh, Ocean, maybe like a little buoy there. Or how, how, how would this kind of work for those places? So... Um one point about the global coverage, um, we've been doing some calculations and those are some initial results that we'll be getting is that we need uh, approximately, and don't quote me on that, but um, something around uh, a thousand, uh, every, one ground station every thousand kilometers. And I'm sorry that I don't know how that is in miles and everything else. Um, so uh, that would be something that we cannot necessarily have in almost all places around the world. Um, that uh, I think that we have a coverage of something around um, 93 to 95% of the, um, of the globe that has uh, a spot that we can put, in theory, a ground station. But of course, there are much more difficult logistical stuff to solve around that. So let's say if there is an island in the middle of the Pacific Ocean, just because there is an island, that doesn't mean that we can have a ground station there, right? That there are like, network connectivity, who's going to maintain it, uh, what's the access to that island and everything else that we need to solve. Uh, but we are aspiring to, to find solutions around this as we grow, especially as we have more community around us to, to help us on that. Okay, yeah, well, in, in fact, you just answered one of my questions. I was, I was wondering how would you uh, be able to connect this if you maybe stick one in, in the middle of the ocean, maybe an island or an, an in, in, uh, oil rig. I, well, I suppose the oil rig might have some sort of um, internet connection now. You know, it, it's the future already. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. okay. <laughs> so, uh, one question, though. Uh, what, do, what do you guys, uh, what else could you do with one of these base stations? Let, let's say you already have it set up in your backyard. Maybe it's not, uh, maybe in the area you are, it's not really getting that much use. Uh, could you do something else with the base station? Yeah, so... Um... If you think about it, what Satnox is, is a rotator that can point whatever in the sky, and also it has a radio receiving uh, subsystem. Uh, so in theory, you can play around with uh, scientific concepts like radio astro astronomy, which is something that we've been uh, actively exploring together with some radio astronomers that have been joining our community. Uh, so interferometry, baseline interferometry, like possibly in the future, there are of course some um, technical issues to, to solve around that. Um, that um, radio astronomy is one of the uh, strong things you, um, that we're thinking as an alternative to satellite operations for the Satnux uh, ground station. Uh, how legal, how legal is this though? Uh, are you just able to listen in on any communication from any uh, Leo satellite, uh, you know, going through the globe, or do you need to ask permission from uh, the operators? Um, so depends on the country and depends on the legislation and um, what kind of license the operator actually has or not, or to what extent can someone waive uh, their right um, on this equipment uh, and give it to someone else that has a license um, in order to be the forefront, basically, of capturing this uh, information. Uh, surprisingly, one of the things that um, you know is really good about having an open source um, uh, community, we do have some legal contributors uh, in, in Satinox. So there's a team of three people right now working uh, around um, um, around the clock, literally, on some aspects um, to figure out some um, legal technicalities around the world and how we can operate uh, within our legal boundaries uh, so that we could uh, not cause any issues to the satellite, to the ground station operators. Yeah, in fact, you just answered my other question. You're really good at this. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, because, uh, you know, I, I, I can imagine if I set up one of these uh, stations in, let's say, in my house, and somebody uses it to uh, maybe... Uh, listen in on a, on a uh, Leo satellite that is probably private and, you know, they don't want to share that information to with anybody. Would that make me le legally, uh, uh, by, uh, what, what, I, what is it, liable, I suppose? Liable, liable. Yeah, liable. Uh, would that make me liable? I, 
that that's one of the questions that maybe people start need to start you know thinking about since I have no control over what the set, my base station would really be pointing at, right? Yeah. So the the main concern legally would not actually be the satellites themselves because uh, for those satellites that the satellite operators and the satellite owners would not like you to listen to the signals, those signals are encrypted or they're activated upon request and everything else. Uh, so everything else that is out there in terms of satellite communications, you can legally capture it. Um, there are some treaties, some outer space treaties and some space treaties between countries um, around those things. but. Um, a rule of thumb would be um, that everything that is transmitted and you can read it uh, on radio amateur uh, frequencies, uh, that would be the 2 meter band, uh, uh, 70 centimeter band, 23 centimeter band and, and upper uh, than that, uh, then uh, you're totally okay legally to actually receive and uh, um, decode and um, supply this information back to the, to the public. Okay, so it, I guess it works kind of like taking photographs outside, right? It's already, everything's out there, and if you're just listening in on it, it's not that bad. Like, okay, I, I, can, I can kind of get an idea for that. Uh, what, what, are you, what are your plans, let's say, for the next five years? Are you planning on making bigger, better base stations? Yeah, once again, focusing on the globality of it, but also the non-profit behind Satnox, which is the Libre Space Foundation. That's the non-profit um, uh, that we set up to support Satnox, basically. Um, we're focusing more on how we can get the space industry, which is right now in a huge explosion and everything is, you know, like... Um, promising and there are many more people working towards space technologies nowadays. Um, we would like to see more and more technologies shifted towards open source software and open source hardware uh, in the liberal way that we, we feel about and our mission feels about. Um, so focusing more on um, on top of establishing a, a solid network of Satnox ground stations, actually impacting the technologies that are out there in terms of CubeSat design, satellite communications, um, what we do on space experiments, satellite design and everything else, uh, and trying to shift that towards open source software and open source hardware. You know, we uh, touched on this a couple uh, times, but I want to make sure we really cover this particular aspect of it. You said, um, uh, we said towards at the beginning of the show, I said at the beginning of the show, that you're actually tracking uh, high altitude, uh, or it's not high altitude satellites, high altitude balloons. <laughs> I did it again. <laughs> First it was high weather balloons, which don't make any sense at all. <laughs> Set it up in a tornado. No, no. Um, but t can, we, can you talk more about how uh, Satnox contributed to this project where they sent up a balloon and were able to track that? Yeah, so balloons generally, not all of them, but, um, well, a lot, uh, actually sent back a, a beacon, uh, an APRS beacon, which is the position that the balloon is, uh, is right now. And uh, this is really useful for retrieval of the balloon, um, but uh, not necessarily uh, the operators of the, the balloon, the people that actually launch the balloon, not necessarily can track uh, the balloon across the sky with omnidirectional uh, uh, antennas. So what we're using Satnox for is to have directional um, pointing of the antennas towards the, the balloon using supplied APRS beacons and then predicting the next um, possible location of the balloon when the next beacon would come and also course correcting along the way. So that supplies us with a, a continuous tracking of the balloon and especially the most important part, like finding the last beacons just before it hits the ground so that the balloon retrieval teams can actually go there and find the, uh, the payload. Um, that's a key concept of high altitude ballooning that you have to retrieve the, retrieve the payload back. So Satnox uh, can be really helpful pointing directionally the antennas towards that uh, that spot and getting the final pain loads uh, for the location. So, so let me understand this. So you're saying APRS, and I don't even know what that means, but that's okay. I'll just make it up. Uh, and, and so it's constantly t sending out a signal in all directions saying, I am at this altitude and this particular GPS coordinates, and you're yeah. trying to receive that, but obviously you've got to be pointed at it to receive that. Do you, how much off-axis error can you have before you start losing the thing entirely? Well, it depends on the antenna that you're using, but it could be something around like 15 to 20 degrees um, oh, okay. for the directional yagging antenna. I was thinking it had to be like within two or three degrees. And I was going, what, you know, if you ever miss it, it's like, oh, now where is it? Do you have hunting algorithms that can kind of listen all in a patch of the sky to try to find something? 
Uh, yeah, so right now we're not doing an active scanning of the sky. What we're doing is that we're getting the final two positions from the APRS and we are extrapolating the next position, the next possible position for balloon. Uh, and uh, once this mm. um, happens, then we are course correcting you know, for the next position using the previous two. So yeah, kind of like predictive uh, position algorithm. Yeah, really cool, simple. cool. Not as, you know, as it sounds complicated, <laughs> but it's a super simple one. Well, you keep it simple first until you figure out something like that doesn't work under these conditions, then you start applying patches, and that's how we end up with everything we got today. So, yes, it's <laughs> yep. oh, software is organic. Software grows according to fitting the needs. Well, we're almost out of time. I think I could probably talk with you for another half hour, but uh, we do have a, a hard limit here on the, on the uh, network. So uh, is there any question I didn't ask, or we, Garamon and I didn't ask, that you really want to make sure our audience is aware of? I think that you asked a fantastic set of questions, and uh, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> I think that you got very all good, of it. very good. And I got to ask my two required questions, or again, my audience uh, emails me and tells me that I forgot to ask the questions. Uh, what's your favorite scripting language? Uh, that would be JavaScript. JavaScript. Okay, well, that's a good answer. It's a different answer than Python. Thank you. <laughs> and your favorite, <laughs> and your favorite text editor. Uh, that would be lately Atom. At Atom is that a what is that? Is that a like a Windows thing? No. Uh, no, no. That's a, well, a GitHub project, open source project. Uh, it's an editor. It's a GUI. I know I suck on GUIs and everything. But uh, yeah. Uh, okay. <laughs> uh, <laughs> originally, that would be VIM. So, okay. Uh, Here you were being really good, say Adam, <laughs> and then I wasn't going to get around to opening that we were not going to save him. Okay, well, I guess I'm the old guy here because I'm still Pearl and Emacs, but that's life for me. Uh, anyway, uh, fascinating show. Uh, uh, I'm glad you were able to come on and talk about uh, Sadnogs. Uh, uh, thanks for coming on the show. Thanks for having us. Very good, very good. And that was uh, Piros uh, Papadeus talking to us about Satnogs. What do you think, Am Amaral? <laughs> I'm just going to leave out your first letter now. That's fine, don't worry. It's Gamerol, that's fine. Uh, yeah, so, you know, I have this new great idea for Kickstarter now. We can actually uh, maybe build a little satellite called Laporte. We can <laughs> maybe have it, you know, stream down Twit videos. And then we could technically have a Leo Laporte up in the sky. <laughs> just an idea. <laughs> I'm not gonna aside from that, that yeah aside from yeah. that yeah no I, I this is actually super interesting i i really like the uh both the hardware electronics aspect the the embedded linux aspect of course uh and and you know the networking part uh the database part is okay you know it's okay that, that's fine i would have probably used maria db but you, you know what's nice about this, though, is it sounds like a great way, especially when you have a rich maker community in an area, it sounds like a great way to bring together those that want to be hardware tinkerers and those that want to be software tinkerers. And, and you know, because I, I could get excited by the software side. I mean, I, you, you heard me ask a couple of questions about scaling. I'm always interested in how people scale and because most of my clients have done it really poorly, and that's why they bring me in to make things go faster. When they, they don't have 50 jobs, they have 50,000 jobs and then 500,000 jobs. Now what do you do for the next thing to happen? So this is really, uh, really, really cool. Um, so I, I'm excited by it. It's 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 great that you could have end to end something that you know because the the balloon was sent out by radio amateurs as well. So it's like you've got you've got people, not government, not uh, not uh, uh, industry, not um, university, but you've got you know private individuals getting together, collectively getting together, and doing something way up in the sky and tracking it and getting data from it. It's pretty exciting, actually. You know, it shows that it isn't just the government's role to do this anymore. So I'm pretty happy with all that. Anything else before we move on? Uh, no, not really. I'm 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 just really actually interested in checking out the uh, software for this. Uh, I'm not sure if we uh, mentioned what uh, if it was in C, C plus plus or something. I, I I do know he mentioned a little Python, Python in there. Yeah, yeah. that's Python okay. Mostly. <laughs> yeah, okay. yeah oh. that's okay. There's, there are plenty of Python programmers. Other people can do that part of the coding. I might help with, say, yeah. the network protocol or something that we could uh, scale pretty nicely. All right, let's move on. We're almost out of time here. So um, we've got Augur coming up next, which I don't understand, but it's uh, according to the buzzwords on the front page, it's Decentralized Open Source Prediction Market Application Platform. Uh, it's uh, based on the Bitcoin protocol, so it's some way of getting consensus and understanding consensus based on the uh, the Bitcoin protocol. I, I may be missing remembering though but well we'll get that figured out next week because that's what the show is we've got coming up after that free switch 
uh, which is a telephony platform. Uh, sounds pretty interesting. We've got uh, the name I couldn't pronounce at the beginning of the show. I'm here. I'm not pronouncing it again. Rachel Romilidis, who is on the OSCON steering committee, and we'll be talking to us about what's happening in OSCON this year because we're going to be there two weeks later. We're going to get some live guests there because they're much better than dead guests. So we're going to get a live <laughs> guest here to come on the show and hopefully make a breakthrough announcement. Uh, we've also got Digicam, which is Advanced Digital Photo Management. Think things like uh, iPhoto for Macs, and I'm sure there's Linux equivalent as well. Uh, just added to the list, we've got Taki, Taki.io, if you want to get a preview of that. That is an open source video chat and screen sharing and uh, file sharing and all sorts of things application. In fact, if it works out really well, we may actually use Taki for at least some segment of that show. I always say that and then it always blows up in my face, but we'll try that. Uh, Gambus which is a free object-oriented basic inspired by Visual Basic, uh, inspired by but not anywhere derivative of the original code. We've got uh, Ichinga, which is a fork of Nagios. That's a uh, network monitoring system. And uh, Ichinga is the uh, Arab, not the heir apparent because Nagios is still uh, live and kicking there. But uh, I think you'll want to take a look at Ichinga when you get a chance. Uh, we've moved the Dart show. We're doing, we moved the Dart show because originally I wasn't scheduled to be on, on that show, and I'm really into Dart. So we moved it down a little bit later. And in place of the two founders, we We've actually got Casper Lund, one of the founders, and Anders Sandholm, which is the project leader within Google, who can talk more about present future of, uh, of Dart. So that's going to be really awesome. Still filling in some stuff on Q3, I guess it is. Um, find out how we're doing with that. The big spreadsheet is list linked from twit.tv slash floss, which is the homepage for the show. Again, if you have somebody that's not on that list, please have the project manager email me, Merlin at Stonehenge.com, and I will put them on the short list for getting on the, the show. We do a live stream. We took some questions from that uh, at 8 p.m. Not 8 p.m. I wish 8 p.m. <laughs> 8 a.m. Pacific time on Wednesdays at live.twit.tv. Uh, that's a UTC 7 currently. It'll be UTC minus 8 uh, coming up in winter. You can follow us on Floss Weekly on Google+, and those are tweeted automatically at, at Floss Weekly if you prefer Twitter. You can follow me on Google+, Plus at Randall L. Schwartz. Again, that is tweeted automatically over on at Merlin, M-E-R-L-Y-N, on Twitter. I will be in Fisle in July, which is the big open source conference uh, in Porto Alegre, Brazil. 5,000 attendees, uh, mostly speaking Portuguese. Uh, my Portuguese is very poco, very poquito, uh, not very much. Um, <laughs> yeah, I think actually that's the Spanish word. Though I think the Portuguese word is not poquito. But anyway... Well, I, that's what I have to make up when I go down there. But they, I get to speak in English. I'm speaking on Dart, doing an hour-long introduction on Dart, which is the reason I want to have the Dart guys on directly. Um, I'm also going to be at OSCON in July, mid-July, late July. Uh, and uh, so if you're at OSCON, please come up and say hi to me, and uh, we will hook up, uh, and I'll be doing a live show from there. So that's the end of that. Uh, Guillermo, what do you want to plug today? Uh, I guess people can uh, either Google... Uh don't Google me, but okay, it's fine. Google. <laughs> Don't Google me. You can not Google me, but you can Google me. Uh, it's uh, at Gamaral on Twitter. Uh, I have a, a YouTube channel where, where I'm posting uh, different projects now. And uh, I guess that's it. Cool. Well, that was simple. All right. Yeah. Well, just a little bit over time, so I want to make sure we get all wrapped up. And uh, thank you, Guillermo, for jumping in on this show because uh, your uh, your your hardware answers are hardware answers. The hardware questions are always appreciated because <laughs> that's my weak area. Yeah, no problem, man. I'm always oh. here. All right. Very, very good. Well, that's all we have time for. So we'll see you again next week on Floss Weekly.